It's the political campaign season in Nigeria, featuring rallies, meetings, and town hall meetings ahead of the 2023 general election. This is one of such gatherings put together by the Nigerian Economy Summit Group, NESG, to provide an opportunity to engage with presidential candidates on the state of the Nigerian economy and discuss strategies for tackling the core issues affecting growth and development. Present in this room are business leaders, private sector players, local and foreign investors, politicians and other key players in the Nigeria business environment. Presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Bola Tinubu, is accompanied to this session by Governors Atiku Bakudu of Kebi State, Nasir Erufa of Kaduna State, Babajide Sawolu of Lagos, Dave Umayi of Eboy State, as well as former Governors Adam Sushumale, Kayode Ifayemi, and Babatunde Raji Fashala, who is also Minister of Works, among others. Incorporated in 1996, the Nigerian Economic Summit Group is a non-profit, non-partisan private sector organization with a mandate to promote and champion the reform of the Nigerian economy into a modern, globally competitive, sustainable, inclusive, open economy. Welcome and guest to the dialogue, Chairman of the Nigerian Economy Summit Group, Niyu Yusuf, said the dialogue was to give effect to common and shared ideas on the economy between the group and critical stakeholders. Mr. Yusuf explains that key issues capable of shaping the economic trajectory need to be the main focus in political campaigns, dialogue sessions and all other engagements leading to the general elections. The NESG, in continuance of our tradition of providing a platform for sharing insights and also perspectives on the Nigerian economy, has organized this presidential dialogue on the economy to accentuate further discussions of the roadmap towards having a prosperous and inclusive economy. Before we proceed to the times, to the agenda for the day, I would like to outline that presidential dialogue will focus on economic issues. Issues around the macroeconomy, exploring the macroeconomic instability, GDP, inclusive growth, productivity, inflation, unemployment, foreign exchange issues, and fiscal management, which also delve into areas of revenue, debt, and oil and gas reforms. Because today's entire dialogue, entire dialogue engagement is focused on these matters, I only want to like to note the following key issues. Firstly, macroeconomic, macroeconomic instability has over the years undermined our economy's efficiency and impoverished our people, especially the vulnerable groups. Our economy has experienced two recessions within a decade. Even though our average growth over the period is still positive, there is need to have more significant improvement in the social economic conditions of our people. Rising inflation have also eroded the purchasing power of the average Nigerian. As a result, unemployment and inequalities have gone to unacceptable levels. Secondly, in terms of GDP and inclusive growth, the economy's cumulative average growth, the average growth rate is extremely low for a developing economy and a frontier nation like Nigeria. The economic capacity to create jobs, to reduce poverty, and to enhance social inclusion continues to be limited due to the narrow growth base that we have today. Also, we are experiencing weak economic competitiveness as the structure of the economy needs to deliver the scale and the magnitude of economic outcomes we desire and also bear in mind our population growth. Thirdly, Nigeria is struggling at the claim of a debt crisis. While our debt to GDP ratio, including ways and means, remains low, debt servicing to revenue 
is high. The ratio starts so on sustainable levels. Invariably, the next administration will grapple with a tight fiscal space if this trend persists. The evidence suggests that while revenue is, is a problem, other factors must also be considered. Our external position is critically worsening the continued fading foreign direct investment. The details of the NSG's assessment of the historic of the historical trajectory of economy that has brought us here and the way forward are captured in the report that we've done called Understanding the Nigerian Economy. And this report has been prepared for all the presidential candidates as our own contribution to the discourse. This report combined with the 2023 macroeconomic outlook that the NSG will launch on the NSA, uh, January 18, offers an extensive set of strategy policy options for driving sustainable national competitiveness, inclusive growth, and shared prosperity. We recommend both reports for your serious consideration and are open as the NSG to work with you afterwards to continue to engage on matters that you might want to explore further in the two reports. Considering the enormous challenges facing us as, as a nation and comforting our economy, it is evident that the new government from 29th of May 2023 must be ready for office from day one and be ready to demonstrate an, underst an understanding of the issues and be capable of appointing the most competent people to key positions that can eat the grand run. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is the NESG's hope and desire that this presidential dialogue will begin a process that is more than just sharing our ideas and insights for the vibrant and dynamic exchange of ideas, of evidence-based insights on critical issues of the state of the economy that shows our leading contenders and presidential candidates to the highest office in the land how to distill strategic focus on policy options, policy priorities, economic reforms that will drive urgent action from day one. This will help anyone elected into the office of president to understand the problems facing us as a, as a country and the importance of well articulated strategies for tackling them. We are honored to welcome you to the summit house this morning. We are also glad to have you in the maiden presidential dialogue. And I wish everyone a grateful celebration. Country. I want to be a giant of Africa indeed. And I want to be one of the major countries driving the global production and you know, policy narrative of the world. But when you look at the size of the growth itself, we can see a huge difference between the nominal growth rate and the real growth rate. The real is where key issues are. This is where we see how this growth rate impacts on the common people, especially when you look at people's income. We can easily compute that. Now, because of the fact that inflation crisis is there, and then we also have um, a new crisis, on the average, Nigerians are earning less heavy. As so we look at the graph, we have the same real income on the average from 2012 to 2021. We are more or less the same, even though our nominal rate is, is, is going up. The same to be said in terms of the dollar rate. These are the crises that we need to talk about. But why do we get ourselves into this? The only solution is to see where the problem came from, and that is our productive capacity. Look at the sectors. How are the sectors of the economy doing? To make any meaningful, impactful policy intervention, 
we need to look at how our sectors are structured. Among these three, even some uh, sectors are recording above 10%, 15%, 20% growth rate. This uh, 2022. Yes, this is this is fantastic. But most sector, most of these sectors contribute lower than other sectors in the economy. Talk about the uh, the, the first sector, the transport and the electricity contribution is really good. But when you look at the high city, you look at the next sector, agri and the rest, you see the growth rate. So especially the agri sector, agri has clearly is it's like the foundation of the economy. It doesn't matter what type of intervention or policy that has been uh, implemented. On the macro stability, when the foundation is weak, every impact will not be felt. And so we need to look at this macro stability very, very seriously. And when we talk about macro stability, we're talking about the inflation rate, talking about the poverty level, talking about the unemployment rate, we're talking about our labor productivity. Let's look at what happens to poverty, especially uh, whether we measure down from the monetary uh, index or we use the multi dimensional index. The situation is not looking good. We moved from defined benefit for an average Nigerian to the rule of markets, especially the rule of markets. We are indeed going forward. Things can change positively. We look at this. The presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Ashiwaju Bola Abetunubu, is the first among the top candidates to appear at the Presidential Dialogue on the Economy put together by the NESG. He took his time to highlight some notable challenges confronting the business environment and investor confidence in Nigeria. He agrees that some bold and decisive steps must be taken once selected to help reduce these myriads of challenges, not ignoring global developments which have also impacted economic outlook across board. Today, at this Nigeria Economic Summit Group, the presidential dialogue, over the years, the NEFG has successfully carved a niche for itself with its annual flagship event in Nigeria Economic Summit, and built a reputation as a respected platform across the continent for pragmatic engagement as well as continuous tracking through its standing sectorial working groups. Importantly, you have seamlessly represented the interests of both domestic and foreign investors. And your collective voice breath light into economic policy and as on occasion that sent to core democratic rights and ideas enshrined in our national constitution. Today, I seek not to deceive you with unrealistic, unattainable promises and policies. Yet, I'm equally averse to repeating the sharp one on imaginative policies that have frequently failed in the past. Instead, I want to express to you my vision of the way forward. I believe this vision is bold yet pragmatic, difficult yet attainable. More importantly, it will yield greater success than the setback if we remain true to our objective and disciplined implementation. Some of what I say you may agree with, some may not. However, I did not accept this invitation to tell you only what you want to hear. As a potential president of this country, 
this diverse and complex nation, my constituency and the scope of my concern encompass a wide breadth. My team and I have the capacity to improve security and reform the economy in a way that gives Nigeria the, its best opportunity to thrive. As governor of Lagos State, I'm glad you are here in Lagos. And I'm glad you are using this building and you are on these streets. If they know the name is safe. Without adequate investment and attention, you will not be here. You won't feel comfortable. So as a governor of Lagos State, we develop institutions and policies that help change the face of the state. And it became a safer place and a more robust energy of prosperity for those willing to walk towards their economic dreams. Why the precise actions and policies will follow will not be identical. We will bring the same practical problem solving approach to the issues confronting the national economy. My core belief is that the private sector must be the prime driver of economic progress. However, government establishes the framework within which the private sector must operate. If that framework is sound, the private sector will flourish. If the framework is free or incomplete, then the private sector will struggle. On microeconomic environment, we cannot dwell into the problems and solutions to our economy without considering the global context in which we operate. In these past 15 years, the world had experienced a financial crisis that came dangerously close to being a global depression. The world also faced a novel pandemic called COVID-19 that yet to flare on its cause. Geographical competition occasioned by the shift in international arrangement has sparked tensions and war such as the war in Ukraine. The extreme weather begat the climate change that further undercut global harvest, lowering food production, increasing shortages, and causing prices and instability to rise. The global economy has been slow to resolve and to adapt, adapt to the new condition. <coughs> Such claims remains unreal, unreliable. Production is suppressed. Trade costs increase. Political tensions spread. During this period of global energy, the economics of growth has been positive, but not close enough to translate into significant improvement in the social economic condition of the people. Our administration, when elected, we urgently address physical, monetary, and trade reform to effect deeply increase domestic production, not serving to curb important inflation, and to ensure better microeconomic stability by accelerating inclusive growth and job creation across Nigeria. Here, let me state,
some general principles that we guide our policies and plans. First, to achieve the economic we seek, we must resolve the pressing security issues. No nation can flourish with the terrorists and kidnappers in their midst. I said this earlier on. Second, individualism has been told to compensate for the lack of global economy by engaging in more domestic production for national or regional consumption. Thus, we have entered the end of both recession and inflation. But this inflation, as well as the recession, are not primarily caused by excessive, excessive demand. This type of inflation is caused by what we go is a temporary drop in production and supply. I do not hold to the mainstream view that all forms of inflation are best tackled by interest rate hikes and strengthening the economy. Supply induced inflation does not lend itself to this harsh medicine. Just as one does not cure a headache by plucking out one's eye. So, I do not embrace the conventional wisdom that physical deficits by the national government are inherently bad. All government, especially this era of their currency, run circular budget deficits. This is an inherent part of modern government. The most part wealthiest government run deficits and do the poorest nation. Most and to do this. A budget deficit is not necessarily bad. Look at Japanese example with high government borrowing and low inflation. The real issue is whether the deficit spending is productive or not. A productive deficit spending is a compound negative. Especially if you back, if back by expecting borrowing of foreign currency. This is not classroom economics, but it is the lesson of the real economic history of nations. Fourth, it is based upon this idea that I believe we must remove the PMS subsidy immediately. It has outlived its use of it. It saved life as a public good. We will never subsidize neighboring countries for a consumption, nor allow a select few to reap point four problems and Called our product. And the something new money will not be saved because we mean that means eliminating from the economy. Instead, we will re redirect the fund into public infrastructure, transportation, affordable housing education and health and strengthen the social safety net for the poorest of the poor. Those are increasing security challenges. Fifth, 
Physical policy will be the main driver. Monetary policy is weaker and a less effective instrument. Bad monetary policy is, of course, destructive. But even good monetary policy cannot carry the load the visitor can. can. Thus, we must steadily remove ourselves from the fiction of trying our project, of tying our project to dollar denominated oil revenue. This is effectively pegging our budget to a dollar standard. It is an updated as well as the fuel subsidy that we mentioned earlier. It is also restricted and ties the economy to slow growth, just as the common man must mentally severe the court to the subsidy, the elite must severe the code to this artificial fiscal restraint. Instead, let us begin to produce budget based upon what we believe is needed to achieve optimal growth without producing excessive inflation. It is a better path to sustainable growth and share prosperity. Therefore, when elected, our budgeting will be based upon projected spending level, needed to push real annual growth to above 10%. Why reducing the unemployment rate so that we can double the economy in seven years? <laughs> Sixth, we are a nation of over 200 million souls. Over and live in urban areas. The vast majority are young. If we do not expand our manufacturing base to provide jobs and also create affordable goods and products for the population, we will have much larger problem on our hands in the future. Our national industrial instrument uh, infrastructure plan must be given the full breadth. This includes solving the power problem, perennial problem that's in the confronting us for several years. Seven, climate change is real. Yes, to achieve a national political consensus needed to address this problem. We must promote climate justice and not cast it as a stack trade-off with the economic growth, particularly for developing countries. I stop here and ask you a question. <laughs> And you ask me not to use firewood. <laughs> Protect my forest. When my children are hungry, I don't. Yes, we believe in the sanctity of agreement and consensus. We sign up. Before Ukraine war. But yet, nobody promised us what we could do to reactivate and recharge the gap. <laughs> what 
what is the level of our development? No. We will, for so to all of you, be bold. What is happening to our goal? Can we attract investors? Can we get waivers? To really bring that out. Uninterrupted, steady, right voting, right transmission of power to drive our economy. It's a must. You can't ask us to sign up. I implement. Something that we cut off our head to cure the elite for that. <laughs> we will achieve all this through close consultation and collaboration with the private sector to determine the right policy mix to get us towards our shared goal. Yes, we talk of inclusive growth. Through productivity. Again. Productivity and competitiveness are essential if Nigeria is to increase us hope and take maximum advantage of African continental free trade area through strong industrial base. For our industries to thrive, they need inputs, many of which are agricultural agriculture day. The present administration has invested heavily in agriculture, providing loans and expanding the country's future area of cultivating land of crops, livestock, fishery, and others. We will also promote vibrant commodity exchange that we guarantee minimum price pricing for produce. With that stimul stimulant, yes, people will resort to aggression. Now we are planting and harvesting only one time a year. So we continue that way. I think we will achieve the growth and food security expected. I say no. We must try minimum two times at this period. We will build on this with a focus on using technology and expertise. To accelerate the growth and yield, we will deliver the critical infrastructure necessary to achieve the commodity transformations and agree business to plug shape, seamless, into higher, more lucrative entry points in regional and global value chains. In fact, the real strength of any economy rests on the backbone of its infrastructure. Already, the present administration has made of presidential strides, completing several key projects all across the country, which has been pending for decades, spanning over 1,000 kilometers of roads and bridges, such as Second Niger Bridge, very proud of The Lagos Ibadan High Speed Rail, connected to Papa Port, the Ajakuta Kaduna Kano Gas Pipeline, the N Energy Train, J7, five new international airport terminals, and many more. 
Building on this foundation, we will accelerate the faithful implementation of the infrastructure master plan, if necessary. Join us to attend it if you are going. But we will adopt proven financial structure till we deliver an acceptable stock of hard infrastructure through seaport to an airport and road, rail, water transportation, linkages that can support our desired economic growth. I assure you. <laughs> Fixing the perennial problem of energy supply is the top priority. I agree with you. There is no version of the world where Nigeria's ambition for itself can be achieved without solving the problem of how to provide energy to homes, businesses across the country. We have privatized power distribution in Nigeria and generation to a certain degree. What we need to do going forward is to improve the enabling environment for that decentralized transmission and deliver cost at reflective tariffs to attract more private investment in this sector. Broad brand infrastructure is critical for the expansion of our technology ecosystem which has already been attracting record amount of global financial attention in recent years. We shall support the sector to grow into a full-fledged digital economy with a significant effect on our economic development and progress. With my group, small and medium-sized enterprises, contributing nearly half of Nigeria's GDP, generating over 80% of all jobs in the country. Our administration will continue to prioritize the implementation of ease of doing business and reform. You, members of the economic need to prepare, think, and let's do, do it together. We shall also prioritize policy that will enable access to credit and promote financial inclusion. Interest rates must be significantly reduced. This will spur a mortgage and consumer credit revolution where cars, appliances, housing will be more available and create an expected growth. Bill. If that is not addressed. Answering questions from a detailed presentation, Bola Tinubu said he would hit the ground running within his first 100 days in office by selecting a team of technocrats that will help him round the country, as he did when he was governor. It was quite interesting because as we saw the challenges with the oil and gas sector, we've also been impacted. And to put this in context, Nigeria's power today comes mainly from um, the thermal and hydro. The thermal is actually 89%. So as we are having the issues with gas, coming from the challenges around the sector, from the oil theft, the vandalization, it's affected the business and affected that sector. It would be nice to just get some more information. Yes, we don't want to give you, we don't want to give out your secrets. But for me, as someone who represents investors, because that's what Transco is about, we do further investment, it would be good to get to know more about what we are going to do specifically in this space. Furthermore, of course, as a female and a female in leadership, I would also like to know some more about what we're going to do for more policies that would, in, that would encourage, create an enabling environment for more female participation 
in key places. I'm not about token appointments. It's more around, I have the credibility, I have the credentials. And when I say I, I don't mean Owen, I mean the general female population, whereby we can have certain policies that will enable more women to play in the sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. The question of our oil sector, you will have identified the problem. Today, there's artificial intelligence, there's technology that can censor those areas of interventions, illegal interventions. Metering is another thing. Reform that is so critical to me, having been in that industry before, I was the first last person on the also condensate project. I separated it from OPEC cuts a mobile made profit. Why are we commingling? And where what is the problem that we are not today at a great advantage to compete with Russia on gas? Because we have not invested. We didn't put invested investment on long-term incentive to compete in Europe. Our gas is in the ground. It cannot turn to money until we push out there. What is the problem? Tax variations. The investors was lower taxes. I don't blame them. But I will grant you the lower taxes and take my divine profit in the future. The divine profit can be discounted. I'm turned to money today. As long as there is guarantee of no destruction and effective commitment to the sanctity of contract. Simple. I won't say more than that. I have a secret in my pocket. Um, you alluded to the global economic crisis, and I agree that to a large extent um, it serves to impact local economies around the world. But when I look around today, the greatest problems that we face, um, you could say, are self-inflicted, very um, disentangled from what is happening around the world. In a crisis, some people suffer and some benefit. In this crisis, it's for Nigeria to benefit that we are suffering, without any question. And I like the point you have made about being part of also Condensate and the role you played in Mobile. And I wanted to just ask you, increasingly I hear that people in government see IOCs and others in the business as privileged people. In fact, um, a senior government official asked the IOCs, if you are complaining so much, why are you still in Nigeria? The truth of the matter is, it is only their body we see, their soul is gone. There is absolute, and I'm sure you know more than I do. What would you do in terms of attitude change? Would your priority be to re-attract private capital? from the IOCs back to Nigeria, because it has little to do with energy transition. 
those companies that are leaving Nigeria today, every day we see them take um, set up operational base, sometimes in Africa, and if for gas, mostly in Guyana. So I ask, what would your attitude be to attracting investment from IOCs? And I'm talking about energy, and that's all I'm going to talk about. The other question would be, um, Olokola LNG and Brass LNG, I was told recently by a diplomat, that if we had prosecuted both projects, today Nigeria would be earning $500 million weekly from exporting gas. What would be your attitude to that? Again, to energy. Um, Nigeria has proven reserve of gas, 200 TCF. Russia has 300 TCF. So if you like, we are um, 60, 66% of Russia. Russia earns 800 to a billion dollars selling gas every day to its enemies in Europe, not friends. So we should be selling, on a daily basis, $600 million from gas. That has nothing to do with global crisis. It is a Nigerian, a proper Nigerian failure. What would you do to turn around Nigeria's energy prospects? Thank you, sir. When there was oil and gas scarcity around the world, isn't it? We were the king. Even our leaders boasted then that money is not a problem, it's our only how to spend it. Now you are broke. Huh? No. You gave, you own 60% of both the gas and the crude on the ground. 60% and you are not the operator. Why not take a critical look and evaluation of that? Cool changes in ownership structure or shedding weight bring more revenue to you? These are questions. I don't want uh, Mr. Selito to get my idea. <laughs> you look at that. To catch the rabbit, you got to give a bit. What is get, taking them to Guyana? There are some incentive in it. Maybe favorable taxes. But instead of having to dig ground and bring, build a city in Guyana, you already have the infrastructure to some extent here. So we'll negotiate. Give up some of the pork belly areas that Nigeria won. I'd rather have 40% and you keep 60. If on the long run, it will give me the necessary incentive and the revenue that I need for an accelerated growth and recovery. You, change, you, see, you find a way to change the formula. Yeah, there are certain things I know I can't say now. I am the first speaker. <laughs> but just take it. If you want an omelet, you've got to break the egg. Ashiwa Jutinobu has reiterated his resolve to urgently address the fiscal, monetary, and trade reforms to effectively increase domestic production immediately, if elected, and many agree with these viewpoints. With renewed hope, 
The ultimate aim of a government led by Bola Ametinobu is to ensure better macroeconomic stability by accelerating inclusive growth and job creation across Nigeria.